Welcome to another episode of Historically Speaking. I'm your host, Michael Dwyer. My topic this time will be U.S. history remembered through stamps. Like a lot of kids of my generation who weren't terribly interested in playing sports or being on teams, I was a stamp collector. I received my first stamp album when I was seven, and by the time I was 12, I had acquired a stamp album just for my U.S. history stamps. That was 50 years ago. It was a tremendously rewarding hobby. I was initially able to draw upon the stamp albums that each of my parents had during the Second World War. The only problem is that when my mother received new stamps, particularly airmail stamps, she pasted them into the album, but I figured out a way eventually to remove them from the album. Stamp collecting was one of those hobbies that, of course, as I finished high school and went off to college, I just never resumed. I had hoped one day in retirement that I might get back to it. That hasn't happened yet. But during this time of COVID and probably having more time to look among my collections and my books, I looked through my stamp albums and it was really a wonderful way to consider some aspects of history that I had not contemplated before. And what I'm gonna be talking about in our time together today are how moments in American history can be remembered through stamps. I'm going to be talking about early stamps up until about 1970. After that point, uh, my collection really stopped. As I just opened this album at random, I found tucked away in here a letter that my grandfather wrote from Argentia, Newfoundland to my grandmother because he had been sent up there because of the construction of an American naval base. And very interestingly, the little tag on the letter opened by a censor because although we were not involved in the war yet, World War II had begun. And the page that I'm just opening to here is just images of airmail stamps from World War II. There are many other aspects of stamp collecting, such as first day covers, maybe as people uh, have the, their interest in this hobby rekindled, we may hear more about that. So let's take a journey back through the pages of my stamp album and what that reveals about how our history is remembered. The earliest postage stamp in the United States dates from 1847. I do not have that stamp. This one, very, very similar, is a stamp from the 1850s, typically of George Washington. It is a perforated stamp, which means that you tear it off from others like it on a sheet. And in those early years of stamps, roughly the first 45 years of stamps, it was pretty much the same people that were depicted. So you have Washington here, Thomas Jefferson, another image of Washington. Benjamin Franklin figured pretty prominently. And the rule as I understood it, I don't know if this has been changed, you had to be dead to be on a United States postage stamp. And the reason for that is when you think of monarchies throughout the world, particularly in the British stamps during the time of the British Empire, there was always an image of the monarch on the stamp. Not so with us in the United States. The first set of commemoratives that were published in the United States were issued in 1893 for the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. This was for the quarter centenary of Columbus's voyages to the New World. And one of the things that's very, very different from our celebration or lack thereof today, at the height of the 19th century, uh, Columbus uh, was a bit of a cult figure. 
there had always been a strong interest in him, but a biography by Washington Irving really propelled him to fame. And we have all these images in Columbus's life that are shown in these commemoratives. Altogether, there were 13 images. I only have several of them because at the time, the higher the denomination of the stamp, the more costly it is, the rarer it is. But as we look at these, we have the fleet of Columbus, Columbus soliciting aid of Isabella, uh, Columbus presenting to the natives. So it's almost in these images is this is the way that we want history to be remembered, history to be staged. A very interesting piece of trivia. The first woman to be depicted on a United States postage stamp is Queen Isabella as depicted on this series. As we move a little bit farther ahead in time, stamps get more interesting, more variety. And here in 1932, we have a special set of stamps. I have the complete set of images to celebrate the bicentennial of George Washington. So in the one cent stamp we see in green, it's a bust of Washington, well-known bust by the French sculptor Houdin. In the one and a half cent stamp, this is an engraving of the earliest image of George Washington, painted by Charles Wilson Peel when he was uh, 40 years old in 1772. And then the two cent, the most common uh, image of the set is the two cent that we see with the very familiar image of George Washington painted by Gilbert Stuart. You may wonder why in 1934 we have this Mothers of America issue. And here we have two different perforations of this very familiar image of what we know is Whistler's mother. This is indeed George McNeil Whistler's mother, Anna Robinson Whistler, who actually was living in London at the time that the painter created this. And it was not very popular when it was first finished, probably in the 1890s. But this painting came to America in 1934 on loan from the Louvre, and the person who did the ribbon cutting at the ceremony was FDR's mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, and so newspapers widely carried the story of the president's mother and this iconic image of American motherhood. 1936-37, we have the Army commemorative issue. And it's interesting here how who is portrayed in the images used associated with that. So with the image of Washington and Nathaniel Green, the Revolutionary War General, we have in the one cent stamp, Mount Vernon in the background. In the two cent stamp, we have Andrew Jackson in his home, the Hermitage, and Winfield Scott, a uh, hero of the War of 1812 when he was a young man, uh, and then uh, the Mexican War. We have the, the trio in the three cent stamps of General Sherman, Grant, and Sheridan. And interestingly, in the four cent stamp, we have Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson with Stratford Hall the ancestral home of the Lees in Virginia. In the Navy commemorative issue of the same year, we have on the one cent, John Paul Jones and Barry, two cent, heroes of the War of 1812, Stephen Decatur uh, and Thomas McDonough. In the four cent stamps, we have images of heroes of the Spanish-American War, Samson, Schley, and Admiral Dewey. Admiral Dewey, who is credited for the victory at Manila Bay. In 
1938, we have a popular series that endured into the early 50s called the Presidential Series. And at this time, stamps were three cents for a common letter. So the most recognizable of these images are the three cent profile of Thomas Jefferson. And with the one and a half cent stamp that we see here, we have the second woman to be depicted on a United States postage stamp, and that is Martha Washington in profile. And among these early presidential images, it parallels, the, the currency parallels the number. So John Quincy Adams is on the six cent, Andrew Jackson on the seven cent, William Henry Harrison on the nine cent, and then John Tyler on the 10 cent stamp. And I don't think there was any other postage stamp that honored uh, John Tyler. John Tyler, often called the accidental president, was the first president who was vice president to assume office when William Henry Harrison died after only a month in office. And at the beginning of the Civil War, John Tyler, who had been out of office for about 16 years, was actually en route to Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, to take an oath of office in the Confederate government. So his death is the only president whose death not to be read into the congressional record. And um, considering the controversy about that from our perspective today, I do not believe that he is featured on any other United States postage stamp. And we go on here uh, with later presidents who are depicted. So we have uh, Grover Cleveland, who is on the, the 22 cent stamp. We have William McKinley, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who is the um, 26th president of the United States. And again, the, the numbers don't match because <laughs> William Howard Taft, uh, who succeeded Theodore Roosevelt, he was not the 50th president, but it's kind of funny that we put our largest president on the 50, on the 50 cent stamp. A series that I find fascinating are this set that was issued to honor famous Americans in 1940. So let's start with the poets here. So from left to right, we have Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, John Greenleaf Whittier, James Russell Lowell, Walt, Whitcomb, Walt Whitman, and then James Whitcomb Riley. So people, uh, without a doubt, would have said that Longfellow, uh, a generation or two ago, was our greatest national poet. People could quote him, people could quote Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere from John Greenleaf Whittier. Once upon a time, virtually every American school child knew, shoot if you must this old gray head, but spare your country's flag, she said, from Barbara Fritchie. And yet today, with the possible exception of Walt Whitman, who wrote free verse in an unconventional style, these aren't people who are studied anymore. James Whitcomb Riley endures as the creator of Little Orphan Annie. So this, this set from 81 years ago is a snapshot of who we revered as national loved poets at that time, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have the same taste today. And from our perspective today, and this has been true uh, as long as I have been teaching, going back almost 40 years, we would say that the best known, most studied poet of the 19th century is not any of these men, but it's Emily Dickinson, who would not be depicted on a stamp um, until, I believe, the uh, centenary of her death. Famous American authors, same thing here. Washington Irving, James Fenimore Cooper, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Louisa May Alcott, 
and Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain. And again, we may know the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Um, we associate James Fenimore Cooper with Last of the Mohicans, but we don't really read that in school anymore. Uh, Louisa May Alcott still endures as a children's author with Little Men and Little Women, but probably the most read of this particular quintet is, of course, Samuel Clemens, Huck Finn, and the other stories that he wrote. Educators here, Horace Mann, Mark Hopkins, Charles Eliot, Francis Willard, and Booker T. Washington. Now, I don't know a lot about all of these. Certainly, I know Horace Mann. Um, Charles Eliot was the president of Harvard, well-known academic. Uh, Francis Willard was a champion of education for women. And Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington was the most widely known African American of his time. This is the first time that an African American man is honored on a United States postage stamp. He became the first African American man um, born into slavery who was invited to the White House, but he had to enter it through the servant's entrance. And the way that we look back on Booker T. Washington today, it's with some controversy because from our perspective today, some people believe that he was much too much of an assimilatist uh, and not urging people to uh, perhaps ask for their basic civil rights uh, with a little bit more force. The scientists, first one here, and this is interesting, we have John James Audubon as a scientist. I would have classified him certainly as an ornithologist for his study of birds, but primarily I would have uh, classified him as an artist or a publisher. And if we look at the other people honored here, Dr. Crawford Long. Now, I could have Googled him before I came to the studio this morning. I honestly don't know who he is, but obviously he was important enough <laughs> to put on a stamp in 1940. Um, we have Luther Burbank for his uh, experiments in botany, Walter Reed, after whom the hospital was named for his work in yellow fever, and interestingly, Jane Addams is classified here as a scientist. Jane Addams, who was the founder of Hull House in Chicago, uh, I think would have been better known as a social worker. I don't think I've mentioned up to this point, in the pages of my album, what I would do is I would complete a set or I would complete the page. I would note when this was done. So you can see my handwriting from all those years ago that I completed this set in May of 1973. Composers, first, uh, first composer, Stephen Foster, whose music uh, we may know the melodies, but we hardly ever hear Stephen Foster's music today because the lyrics are considered to be so racist. John Philip Sousa endures as the March King. Uh, Victor Herbert, uh, certainly a composer of popular operettas, but again, that's not to public taste today. Uh, Edward McDowell, classical music. Now, here is another one. I don't know who Ethelbert Nevin is. The artist, Gilbert Stewart, Washington on the dollar bill. Whistler, we've seen his mother. Augustus St. Gaudin, sculptor of Lincoln statues, same with Daniel Chester French, and Frederick Remington, a painter of the Wild West. And the inventors. Eli Whitney, the cotton gin, Samuel Morse, the telegraph, Cyrus McCormick, the reaper, Elias Howe, uh, the sewing machine, and Alexander Graham Bell, whose name, of course, is synonymous with the Bell Telephone Company. <laughs> 
One of my favorite sets uh, that I was able to buy a mint set of, and it's just uh, such a wonderful remembrance of this time during the Second World War, is this of the overrun countries. So obviously the war began, the Second World War, uh, with the German invasion of Poland in 1939. Czechoslovakia had already been swallowed up. And then in the spring of 1940, uh, when after the Sitzkrieg or the Phony War, the other countries that very quickly uh, fell uh, to the German invasion, Norway, Luxembourg, etc. But we also have here how the Axis spread to the east with Greece, Yugoslavia, Albania, etc. So uh, a lot of history comes to mind when we look at this set. At the end of the war, we have an army commemorative issue, a navy commemorative issue, and then this uh, well-known image of the historic flag raising at Iwo Jima. And since Roosevelt died, Franklin Delano Roosevelt died on April 12, 1945, we can see these four stamps that honor him in the various places that he lived. So we have in the one cent stamp uh, his family home in Hyde Park, New York. Secondly, uh, where he spent a great deal of time in his, theria, uh, his therapy from polio at Warm Springs, Georgia. And again, the three cent stamp has the longest occupant of the White House. And then uh, enshrined in the five cent stamp, his famous uh, For Freedom speech. In 1951, we have a stamp here for the Confederate Veterans Final Reunion issue. And here we have an image of a young man and then one of the last uh, survivors of the Confederacy. And again, this tells you on something that was given priority at that time, perhaps not in the same way today. After the first presidential series that I showed you earlier, we have another set of well-known national historic landmarks. And um, at this time, probably the, the best known two images are the three cent Statue of Liberty. And then when stamps went up to four cents, the one that you would see most often is this image of Abraham Lincoln. We're starting to get now in the 50s much more variety in what is portrayed on stamps. So we have Booker T. Washington honored in a stamp in 1956 that shows the slave cabin in which he was born. And remarkably, for the uh, 250th anniversary of Benjamin Franklin's birth, we have this strange allegorical painting by Benjamin West made long after Franklin's death that shows him in a godlike pose discovering electricity. And then you can see the other wildlife conservation issues. In 1958, 59, we begin to honor Lincoln with his rise to the centennial of his rise to national prominence with the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And a set that was issued in 1960 that, that I like very much, this was called the American Credo issue. And here we have quotes, uh, many of which people used to know from George Washington observe good faith and justice uh, toward all nations. We have Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. And Francis Scott Key, author of The Star Spangled Banner, in this be our motto, in God we trust. <laughs> 
In the early 1960s, we had another series called Champions of Liberty. And we have some people who might not be as well known to American uh, mainstream students. So this stamp honors Gustav Mannerheim, who was a liberator of Finland. And then in the other ones, we have Giuseppe Garibaldi, the leader of the Red Shirts, who was a leader in Italian unification and establishing Italy as an independent country. We start to see typical design changes here in the Boy Scouts and the Campfire Girls issue of 1960. And in 1961, we also have another Champion of Liberty issue honoring Mahatma Gandhi. Design changes, workman's compensation issue, a Frederick Remington issue, and interestingly, Republic of China. This is an issue of Sun Yat-sen, who was the president of the first Chinese Republic in 1911, and a very modern looking image of nursing. There are some very famous flaws among stamps, and uh, I do not have the famous upside down airmail stamp of 1918 that's probably worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. But in this stamp, honoring Dag Hammarskjöld, who was a Secretary General of the United Nations who died in a plane crash, you're not supposed to see this white streak on either side of the United Nations building, but I guess that since so many of these flawed stamps were issued, it's not a rarity. Continuing onward, we see typical stamps of the 1960s. Uh, my favorite, of course, was the Kennedy Memorial issue, which was, um, which was issued the spring after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Continuing into the 60s, one to honor Robert Fulton, the creator of the first steamboat. I love the image of the little girl and the John Singleton Copley, one of our great early American artists. Picture of Adley Stevenson. And certainly in the settlement of Florida issue, you can see that it looks like a Spanish conquistador who is represented here. Again, more 60s imagery here from migratory birds to the humane treatment of animals to the American Circus Bill of Rights. In 1967, we have a, an issue, a stamp that I like very much, of Mary Cassatt, the American artist who spent much of her life in France. And this image shows one of her most loved paintings called the boating party. By this time in 1967, I'm already actively collecting, and what I would do, like most kids would do, is soak the stamps off envelopes. And when I had soaked off this envelope of Henry David Thoreau, my grandmother said to me, my goodness, couldn't they have found a better picture of him than that? But that really does look like Henry David Thoreau. And again, historic flag series during the American Revolution. And I began towards the end of my collection to collect plate blocks, as we can see in this natural history issue. So I hope that you have enjoyed looking at these images with me. And even though I don't collect anymore per se, it's wonderful to have these images uh, preserved, and one day I may go back to it. Thank you for watching.